Hey, what's up? This is Evan, and I'm very excited to bring to you a very special interview today, and this time from out of town. I'm from Singapore, and currently we are in the beautiful city of Taipei, Taiwan. And if you appreciate the effort, please drop a like and subscribe. And here with me is the person behind the very popular origami software, the Box Splitting Studio. Please welcome Tai Mozun. Okay, Mozun, thank you so much for accepting this interview and uh, with the tight arrangement accommodating my uh, travel plans. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, before we begin, I want to uh, ask you this. This oh, one. <laughs> yeah. So through my travel, the packet is a little bit uh, crumpled up. So uh, these are from uh, my uh, sponsor that oh, I okay. managed to get. Okay, so these are Gidamame beans. So they are uh, ah. in two flavors. So sriracha and sea salt. Right. Yeah, okay. So. Um, Affiliate link will be in the description <laughs> below. As well as uh, I got something else for you, something from Singapore. So uh, these beans are also from my friend, also from. Uh, so these are chocolate. Okay, so this is ah. um, hey tarik. Okay. Tarik means pool, so it's like the the, the tea they will just pool like that. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, right, right, one right, cup right. to another cup, mm -hmm. and this is um, yes. nanyang kopi, mm -hmm. uh, nanyang cafe. So it's yes. uh, chocolate flavor. Okay. Yeah, chocolate in these flavors, so you can uh, enjoy. It. Yeah. <laughs> this are for you. No, oh, thank you. Oh, shoot, I should have brought some <laughs> It's okay, it's okay. No worries. Okay, <laughs> okay so uh, first question coming from Ivan. Since you have designed the box splitting studio, yeah. will you consider doing a hex splitting studio? Oh, okay, okay. So so that one, I, I, I got I asked a few times in the past. and uh, mm. um, um, to, to be honest, uh, it's, it's a bit unlikely because uh, personally, I'm not really a big fan of hex bleeding and uh, uh, mainly because the pre-creasing is much more difficult <laughs> than, than box bleeding. Okay. And um, I, I think one of the mm. uh, most important motivation behind hex bleeding originally was to uh, have a better efficiency over box mm. bleeding because uh, by the time uh, Especially Robert J. Land came mm -hmm. up with the, the idea of hex bleeding. Um, the construction for for the Pythagorean stretch is not yet quite mature, and uh, there's a lot of cases that cannot be handled. So uh, by that time, hex bleeding is considered slightly more efficient than box bleeding. But right now that we have a full theory for constructing uh, Pythagorean mm -hmm. stretches, I doubt that we still need hex pleading, uh, except for perhaps uh, seeking for a more interesting structure because uh, many people consider box pleading boring or mm. it's just too predictable and hex pleading often come up with some surprises. That is true. Mm -hmm. So far I haven't designed anything in hex pleading myself yet. So, okay. um, and when it comes to software engineering, the necessary calculation behind hex bleeding is totally different from box bleeding. Is in in that box bleeding can be represented simply by integers. Uh, why hex bleeding? You need to come up with something involving square root of two, and mm -hmm. that will make the computation much more complicated. And even if I want to go that direction, it's going to be a totally different software than box bleeding studio. So. I, I think before I'm thoroughly done with Box Media Studio, probably I'm not going to step into the direction just yet. But, but I, I would definitely encourage people, if they want to do it, go, go ahead and give it a try. And I would love to assist in any way I can. Yeah. Very, very good. Yeah. So you were also uh, mentioning about uh, the, the square root 2. That's also very um, characteristic of the 22.5, right? Oh, yeah. So, that, that's true. Um, one of my questions, uh, I forgot. Oh, sorry, I, I, think, I, I think I said it wrong. Uh, mm. for, for the hex bleeding, it's probably square root of 3. 3 root of 2, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I said it wrong. Yeah. yeah, so that moves to the next question. Uh, will you consider something like a 22.5 studio? Okay, that I think got asked even more than <laughs> asked me but because a lot of people, including myself, are a big fan of 22.5 mm. studio because it's just so elegant and it's, yes. it's just something that is so natural for, for mm. origami and we, we all want to see that happen. Now, the, the problem is that so far we don't really have a complete solution for a top down designing method for 25 degree system yet. And by top down, I mean we first uh, came up with a specification or what I call an abstraction for the design, mm -hmm. and then we reverse engineer what kind of priest pattern will lead to that abstraction. Um, that's what I mean by top-down, and so far 
we are quite far from having that kind of solution or an algorithm for going from an abstraction to a 22.5 degree uh, design. And as far as I know, most of the time people design 20 degree system uh, partly by using their intuition and partly by trial and error. So, so they're just combining a lot of knowledge including tiling and some some uh, patterns that they know from experience and they just put it together know that mm -hmm. if I do something like that, maybe this will work and if not, I just fold it and try it and see if I can mm -hmm. eventually get what I got. Uh, 20 over 5 degree most of the time is kind of designed that way. There, there is no systematic way uh, to get there. And, but if there ever is one, then I would definitely love to look into mm -hmm. the possibility of building a software on, on that. Yeah. But I'm still waiting if somebody can make a breakthrough. Uh, at, at least I don't really have a clue. I, I try to study the, that, that kind of top-down approach for 22 providers, or you can call that an octagon pleading, mm -hmm. similar to the hexagon pleading. So uh, I tried to go into there, but I didn't go very far because it's just so complicated. I, I don't know, at, at least I don't have a good, good solution to that, but I'm, I'm looking forward to if they're going to come up with something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. So what are your comments on, uh, say, the ERM to put it into a software base? Oh, right, right. So by ERM, he's referring to the Edge, Edge River, River method. Something I'm, I'm promoting and uh, to try to get this concept more popular. Or if, if you want to go to the ERM studio, that's probably the very long-term goal for Boss Media Studio, in, yes. But I think I'll, I'm still a very long way from actually getting there because especially in the box cleaning case, there is still lots of edge cases that I, I don't uh, have a complete solution yet when it comes to ERM design. And I have a rough picture as to how to mm -hmm. do it, but there's, there's some edge cases I still need some trade and error in order to actually get the crease pattern. So I cannot make it fully automatic just yet. Right, but uh, hopefully someday I will make that happen. I, I indeed intend to build something. So when you're talking about this edge case, um, what, what do you actually mean by that? Uh, for example, some transition mm -hmm. units, uh, if I actually, there, there is actually a general algorithm for building cons uh, transition components in the ERM, but if I actually apply that algorithm, it will usually end up in something ugly. So it, you, you right. won't fit nicely into the framework of box bleeding. Mm. And Although it is technically possible to construct a nice transition components in within the framework of box splitting, I again I don't have an automatic algorithm mm -hmm. to actually get there. I have to fold uh, the major part of it and then just try to uh, force flat the, the remaining part and see if I can come up with something nicely. And if I do, then yeah, that's the solution. Yeah. So uh, it's, it still involves some kind of training error mm -hmm. process like that, but at least. With ERM, I can uh, pretty much fix the, the majority of the crease pattern and I, I know where things is going to go. It's just some details that mm -hmm. needs to be filled manually by that process. So yeah. while I was holidaying the past few days in Taiwan, uh, what have you been up to? Oh, right. So, um, okay, so it's not, not, not nothing too exciting. I was, mm -hmm. I was uh, busy taking care of my daughter and uh, my mother-in-law is going to the hospital, so mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of... Uh, busy here and there. If I got some remaining time left, I, I'm finalizing the, the upcoming new version for the Box Media Studio, mm -hmm. version uh, 0 0.7, and uh, it, it's, it's about to get released. I, I'm, I'm hopefully that uh, by the time this interview video get released, I can perhaps uh, release the new version on the same day, so mm -hmm. then that would uh, may, make a good marketing effect. And I'm, yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm yeah, not yeah, sure yeah. about that. Okay. So uh, firstly, wishing your family all the best, right? Okay, yeah, thank um, you. Could you give a brief uh, introduction of yourself? Right, okay, so uh, my name is Mu Chun Cai, or in Mandarin is Cai Mu Chun, uh, where the Mu uh, kind of stands for shepherd, and Chun yeah, is yeah. like a village. So, I, I saw uh, that on the Instagram. Right, right. so uh, you, you can say basically like my name is Robin means like a spiritual leader of a group of people mm -hmm. and I kind of hope that's kind of what I, I'm doing right now mm -hmm. in, in terms of origami's software development community mm -hmm. and amazing yes. right right it kind of, kind of coincidental uh, I've been doing origami design for I think about uh, 12 years and mm -hmm. 
Uh, I'm also a professional programmer, and I've been doing programming for over 25 years right now. Wow. Uh, professionally, for like probably six, seven years, actually, before I, I was uh, do, doing programming as a hobby. But uh, I, originally, I was studying pure math, mm. uh, but then I switched career and become a professional software pro developer. I see. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite place in Taiwan? That favorite place, like attraction, you mean? Yeah, attraction, yes. Okay, so judging by the number of time I revisit the same place, I, I'll definitely say the National Museum of Natural History in Taichung. Mm. Yeah, that, I, I, I've been that that place for more more than a few dozen times. There, before I get married, I, I insist I'm going there at, at, at least once every year. Wow. Oh, yeah, I, I just love love science. That's mm. that's why I did. that place is kind of like uh, science believers gather in places like they are. You, 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 you know what I mean. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so I think I missed it. <laughs> it's not in my itinerary. I should plan that next time. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Going, going, from, going to Taichu is a little distance from here, so mm -hmm. I, I don't expect too many people who come to Taiwan for travel will actually go there, but mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good museum. Your favorite Taiwanese food? Okay, so that, that's another tough question, too, <laughs> because how would you define Taiwanese food? Because a lot of mm -hmm. Taiwanese cuisine actually have Chinese origin, yes. and some are influenced by all the different foods mm -hmm. over the world, including Japan, and Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. US, or whatever. So I tried to look up a few things that I believe is pure Taiwan origin, mm -hmm. and some of our favorites include the Dalton Pai. That's like a medicinal... Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, the, 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 the pork rib soup. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. And let, let me check out my notes. Yeah, yeah. Um, oops. So a lot of uh, people like come here for tea pie, mian sian. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All of right. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, those, those are two famous. Uh, common, uh, very yeah, common. That doesn't need doesn't need need you, my yes, special yes, mention. Yes. Dongshan Yato. Dongshan. Yes, Dongshan Yato. Duckhead. Duckhead. Yeah. Dongshan oh, Duckhead. Yeah. That's 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 something. Uh, this uniquely Taiwan and, mm. um, and it's basically fried duck head <laughs> right so you eat the whole duck head okay, from okay. the beak to the wow. eye to the brain but okay, I didn't know that sounds scary but it actually tastes awesome okay perfect. yeah yeah so, okay and then we have the the heated braised snacks which uh, uh, is called the jiao uh, wei braised snack yeah okay yeah yeah uh huh that, that's, that's also pretty awesome and of course the Taiwanese style beef noodle soup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. that's a definitely worth trying. Uh huh. So uh, other than that, well, if if you allow a few other options that that is not purely Taiwan origin, but you, you find good Taiwanese variation over here that includes sticky tofu, of course, mm -hmm. tea egg, and also omelet. That, 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 those are all worth worth trying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Taiwan is known to be very touristy. So what are mm -hmm. some of your recommendations? So other than the Taichung Museum. Okay, so there, there's a few places that people will definitely go, including the Taipei 101 mm -hmm. and the, the, the Palace Museum, so I, I don't need to mention those. Mm -hmm. Among those that are less well-known, I, I would recommend a few places, including the, the Yellow Geo Park, Yelio. Yelio, okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good place, and Beitou, mm -hmm. for the hot spring. Okay. Okay, and then also the Lin Family Mansion Garden, uh-huh, that, that's in Banqiao. Oh, okay. the Lin family mentioned uh, in in Chinese it's called Lin Lin Jia Hua. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very well preserved old style Chinese garden. Mm -hmm. So that's that's also very worth seeing. So uh, Taiwan is known to have a very vibrant music industry, producing numerous superstar artists. So, like, who is your favorite? And yeah, what are some of your favorite songs? Oh, I, I, actually, I don't quite listen to Chinese pops myself. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I actually just listen to more to. To Japanese pop, so mm. or or musicals, or 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 even classical music operas, or things like that. But mm. when I was a kid, I listened to a lot of songs by Zhang Yusheng. Zhang Yusheng, yeah, 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 yeah. He passed away in 1997, but mm. but he, he was a uh, iconic singer in, in, in Taiwan history, and I, I believe his English name is Tom Zhang. Yeah, mm. but probably people don't really Tom, <laughs> Tom Zhang. Okay. Yeah, yeah, don't don't really know know much about him, and uh in. In recent years, there, there's also one song I really like. It's the Red Scarf by Weber. In Chinese, it's Zhu Bu Ke. Zhu Bu Ke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a that's a very nice song. Uh, I, I love it in recent years. Uh, other than that, I don't really know much about <laughs> yeah about a Mandarin pop song. So yeah, you're asking. Right. <laughs> 
So uh, how is the childhood like? Okay, uh, it was tough. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I, I have Asperger's, and uh, because of that, I, I, I don't really make much friends in, mm -hmm. in school, and most of the time I just mind my own business, even either reading books or, or do my own computer stuff. So I, 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 mm -hmm. I began programming since I was a kid, and wow, I mostly yeah. just, just focus on, on those things. And Whenever I go to school, j j just got hated by, by other kids. And oh no. Yeah, because I, I just don't know how, how to deal with, with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's part of part who, who I am. But, but uh, later, later on, as I grew up, I, I kind of overcome that situation and began to know better about how to hang around with people. So fortunately, it didn't uh, follow me all the way oh. to now. So eventually, I, I, I become a more or less socializable person. Yeah, mm -hmm. although I still don't like socially, but at least I can do a little bit. <laughs> right, amazing, nice. So how do you start doing origami? Okay, like 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 every kid, we, we all do a little mm -hmm. bit of origami when we were kids, but uh, I didn't seriously try to get into origami until I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. And mostly because of the influence of uh, June. Maikawa mm -hmm. and also Satoshi Kamiya. Yes. Yeah, because, because uh, they, they just do amazing stuff and, and, and especially because I, I was studying math, that I, I would be interested in that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So I become more and more involved in folding complex stuff and then I just fall in love with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was like roughly about 15 years ago and uh, a few years later I began study to uh, begin to design a, a few simple stuffs oh, okay. uh -huh. but uh, it, it wasn't really until I get into trouble in my life uh, that, that I really s uh, start serious uh, into origami design so let, let's just say um, I, I, I got dropped off of, of grad school because of personal reason let's just mm -hmm. put it that way uh, to totally unworthy but uh, Life shit happens, mm -hmm. and uh, I, w I was in a terrible low tide of my life, and uh, and I was uh, forced to go to places uh, totally off grid, and w without any resource or any support, and uh, I totally don't know what to continue, and then I just remember origami, and I was just, wow. I, I still got origami. Okay, so let's let's do it, and okay. because. With origami, all I need is paper. I, yes. I don't need anything else, and I can, I can just forget about all the trouble and just focus in on folding and mm -hmm. try to try to get get peace in my mind. Mm -hmm. And and then it just worked. And uh, I, I somehow I, I make makes uh, make a breakthrough in my own uh, design career, and then I just find out how to make things work the way I wanted them to, to work and eventually that becomes the, the prototype of the ERM. And also I spent a few years just studying the, the book by Robert J. Dan very carefully and try try to think how that interacts with the theory of my own. And I get into a certain stage when I think, okay, I'm I'm ready, then I began to write to him. Mm. Okay. And fortunately he gave me very good feedbacks and he Give me really good encouragement and bring to totally bring hope to my life, and mm -hmm. I just decided, okay, this this is it. I'm going to do origami for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, just like that. Oh, amazing! That's mm -hmm. so inspiring. Like, wow! I also didn't I didn't know about that. How's your 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 education life? Like, how did you progress after that incident? Right. Uh, so before that, I was working very hard uh, towards my PhD in math, and mm -hmm. I was mainly studying in. Uh, number theory as well as convert torques, especially graph theory. Coincidentally, uh, the, the number theory part actually helped me a little uh, in my theory of the GOPS, and mm. uh, and I, I was I was doing pretty successful. I have a few papers published, and uh, I was about to receive uh, an extra scholarship from from the grad school, but then shit happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So GPS was like this uh, global offset, uh, the generalized General offset, offset Pythagorean stretch. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then the, 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 that's that's a terrible name. So just call it Python. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm right. glad that people come up with a a, a very good short sure name for that. <laughs> name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Moving on to career life, how how is it like? So in your blog, you mentioned you are a professional software engineer. You uh, build apps for a living. So what are some of the things that you build? Right, so uh, I'm, I'm mostly 
involving uh, projects of e-commerce. Mm -hmm. So it's like building platforms where uh, consumers can go and check various different products and, and place orders or things oh, like that. Wow. Uh, now, the major project I'm involved in right now, it has to do with the call machine industry. Okay. So you probably see call machine all, yes. all the way in, in here in Taiwan, and I, I, I believe in some part of uh, Asian country as well. Uh, so uh, we were designing systems that uh, allow people to like join a membership and have like a rewarding system when, when, when you go go play the, the call machine, mm. things, things like that. And we have all kinds of uh, promotion using that so, so we can track more uh, spending mm -hmm. on that, things like that. Right. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, this for the students. So how do you um, juggle school with uh, origami? Right. So, so when I was in grad school, I was actually working pretty hard, as mm -hmm. I mentioned. So I only do okay origami occasionally, like maybe on weekends or when I just spend a whole day trying to force some crazy stuff I started coming out and things like that. Uh, but other than that, I was quite focused mm -hmm. in on studying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that was a lie. I, actually, I, I spent a whole lot of time pro programming as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but anyway, I I, I still started pretty hard. Mm -hmm. that, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of uh, very intelligent people in origami, I realized. So as a working adult, so how do you juggle work with origami? That wasn't really where the hard part is. I, I would say that the, the hard part is what happens after you get married and start family? That's where you really need to start juggling. Before that, when I, when, before I get married, uh, uh, it's easy because just just after a whole day of work and the rest of the time I can do whatever organ I want. I got a lot of free time, and I thought I was busy. No, that that I wasn't busy at all. And, and only after I start a family, I realized that mm -hmm. uh, uh, since, since now I barely have any free time to do anything. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I even need to sneak a few minutes in, in uh, during daytime to to uh, secretly do do my origami stuff. Don't tell my boss about that. <laughs> yeah, and since my daughter was born, I barely thought anything mm -hmm. in the past two years. Because uh, she she she's just like me. She she also has Asperger's, mm -hmm. obviously, and it's very hard to deal with that kind of kid. And because it's almost impossible to communicate with, and uh, I, I have to put a lot of effort in order trying to help her get in mm -hmm. the situation. And that's why uh, in the past two years, I almost done nothing other than than. Then develop a BP studio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I just can't find any free time. But I hope that eventually I'll get, get back to it because I still got so many designing ideas. I want to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's difficult now. <laughs> I'm sure you'll succeed. <laughs> All right. <Yeah>. Hopefully. <laughs> you will, you will. You mentioned that you also uh, started uh, designing origami about uh, 12 years ago, you're saying? Yeah, roughly. roughly. Mm -hmm. So, how's the process like? Okay, so in, in the beginning, it, it was just Purely Troy and Arrow. Mm. Uh, so just um, have a very rough concept and maybe start by some well known classical base and then just just progressively try to get towards the direction I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. But then after uh, I acquired more knowledge in the systematical design, especially the tree theories and circle packings and stuff, I started be able to systematically just start with a subject and what was an abstraction and then start to be able to lay out the flaps on the sheet and just mm -hmm. have a correct position from the, from the beginning and then it started to get obvious that we, we all know the weakness tree theory is that the subject has to considerably resemble the tree structure mm -hmm. so uh, it's more difficult to actually get large flat surfaces and stuff. I started to realize that we can actually generalize tree theory to cover uh, 2D or even 3D structures just by generalizing the concept of river. So I, mm -hmm. I make it into what I call the, the edge river. And it just suddenly that, that everything makes sense. You, you just have river flowing from one lake to another or either like that or just, just have the river flow to the edge of the sheet or I call it mm -hmm. the sea. So either flow to the sea or flow to the lake. That, that's very natural. Yeah. And then we just arrange all those waters on the sheet and then it will collapse uh, into whatever place I want. So so then I have the utilities for able to design all those flat surfaces and that, that allows me to come up with things like this where it has 
large yes. services and, and including some of the details, 3D structures and things like that. That's pretty much how my design method evolves. Yeah, I, I saw, remember I saw this on your blog, so it says like a cat cat that was like lying down, right? Right, the, originally. The, the, the pieces yeah. are all apart, then all the, the, the grids all uh, come together with folds into this structure itself. Yes. So amazing. How's the origami scene in uh, Taiwan? And uh, any notable artists from Taiwan you would like to bring to our attention? Oh, right, right. So um, we only began to have an origa uh, origami association like um, like eight years ago. Mm. Uh, back then, we have a major international exhibition in Qimei Museum. Oh. You probably heard of that, it's in Tainan. Yes. Uh, and we invited artists from all over the world, and and because of that, we, we take that opportunity and found the Taiwanese Origami Association. And only until the like, past two, three years that we have many a younger generation artists join, joining the, the team and now, now uh, we are starting to promote origami all over this place mm. and we we just really held lots of origami meetings and we have talks, exhibitions and all, all, all that kind of stuff. So I, I think we're just about to get started. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're on the right track now. Good. Uh, and speaking of artists, I'm not familiar with people, but I, I think I can give a few worth mentioning names, like Chen Weili. Mm -hmm. Okay, he, he's well known internationally as, as well, and I believe he taught, he taught in the, the first Oregon Marathon yeah. before. And also there's, there's a younger artist called Huang Zhenmin. He also has uh, some book published on Amazon as well. Mm -hmm. And other than that, I, I can't guarantee I will say their names right, so I, I'll just skip that. But we, we, we do have quite a few very enthusiastic young generation artists coming, very looking forward for, for what they're going to do mm -hmm. in the following years. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, so uh, I also noticed like, like when you go to, uh, go to the bookstores or um, I remember I was in a souvenir store or what, then they, they, they have even origami ornaments, they have like... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 actually, that surprises me as well yeah. because I don't quite remember seeing those. I, I, I saw like ceramic ones, but I, mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen metal ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Then also the, the ones about the, the Yuan Zhu Ming. The right. Of origins, right? Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They, they got that one. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. When you're doing your diagramming and your ERM map, so what software do you use? Okay, so, do you do so originally in, in those few dark years of mm -hmm. my life, actually, I don't have access to computer at, at all. So I just hand draw all my diagrams. I actually brought them with me over here. Oh, these, wow. these, these are my original uh, hand stretch, stretches, and uh, the, these are all the. Uh, the diagram so drawn. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and these these are the kind of stuff I I, I send to. This is this is a, a pencil. Oh oh, oh it's it's photocopy, but oh, originally yeah. it's it's pencil. Too. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. It looks so professional. Uh, that's what Dan said. That's right. <laughs> but uh, uh, but I still hope to digitalize them uh, someday. I'm I'm working on that slowly. Uh, I just okay. uh, published my my first. Uh, Digital diagram not too long ago about the the same but the the, the same Sega. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that's also originally uh, diagram somewhere in here. I think it's probably in here with originally. So every line is hand drawn. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was amazing, amazing. Oh yeah, originally it was here. It's just one page of description <laughs> because I, I I I know the details, but but then it becomes. Uh, uh, a diagram for over a hundred steps, and yeah, but but this this is what it originally looks like in, in my in, in, in my hand notes, right? Okay, wow. Uh -huh. Okay, we will take a further look into this later. <laughs> okay, that's for the, the the ones in the past. So the your diagramming process currently. Oh yeah, yeah, and then then I just use Inkscape for for mm -hmm. diagramming. Yeah, both both for the uh, drawing the ER diagram and and the uh, the folding diagram as well. Yeah. For the obvious reason that it's free. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, gotta use what's out there, right? <laughs> right, right, right. So who are the biggest influencers in your origami life and uh, what lessons did these uh, people teach you? Well, the, obviously it's Robert J. Mm -hmm. because he, he not not only put my life together and he's also the, the biggest influence uh, in my folding style and my designing methods as, mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. 
you mentioned that you sent a cockatoo model. Oh yeah, that's right. Him, and then yes. he, he he said something about it. Oh yeah, because because when I was designing this one, I wasn't actually looking at a photo of cockatoo. I just tried to design it from from the top of my head, and oh. I get one detail wrong because I thought that the crest is actually behind the head. So I, I designed a structure like, like this, so then pointed out that the, the cross is actually not on the back of the head, it, it, it actually extends from the front. So then I make this, the chain over here to suggest that this, this is actually extend from, from the forehead. But one continuous uh, right. over here. Yes, so uh, I can show you the original, oh right here. Right here. So this, this was how it originally looks like. It's what your origin looks, looks like ah, this. Okay, okay. Yeah, and he just pointed out, okay, so if you do it like that, then, then it was mean that the crest it comes on from the back of the head, but, but that's, that's, not, uh, that's not correct. So, so then he made the suggestion, so I sent it the version 1.5 to him again. Oh, wow. point, point about, okay, so I made it like this instead. So just make a, make a fix so, so at least ex extend from the forehead, not from the back. Yeah, that makes it slightly better. All so right. yeah, you also mentioned you uh, sent your elephant to him. Oh right, right. Ah, I didn't brought the elephant. Ah, but, sorry. Yeah, but I, I have the, the diagram over here. The, this one. This this was the very first diagram I sent him. Uh, mostly because uh, he also had a, an elephant design in his book, and I was. Sending my version to him, and hopefully that uh, may, may, maybe this this design can join the elephant her someday. But ah, so yeah. so far so far then does doesn't have any plans to publish the third edition of his book. So may, maybe I have to wait a little, little. But he did like this elephant design a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and he has some some very nice words to say about this, especially the the three D head design and also the, the log folds on the back. And mm -hmm. some some things like that, it, and also for its efficiency because it pretty much use, utilizes the entire sheet. That that wow. the, this dex is exactly on the corner, and it only occupies one layer of paper, not nothing extra. So it's it's very very, very efficient. efficient. Yes, and this is pretty much the largest possible elephant you can make out of a square sheet of paper with this level of details. Oh, yeah, because amazing. it utilizes every inch of, of paper, and mm -hmm. absolutely nothing is waste. I designed an elephant as a result of my notion of the overflow, which is a way of analyzing the waste inefficiency in designs. And I analyzed a few different elephant designs and done some studying of how, why some are bigger than, 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 the, than the others. And I noticed that many of them have some ways of efficiency especially on the belly and mm. I, I just decided I'm going to completely remove it and then just make it as efficient as possible mm. and that's the outcome. Right. I see. So the so yours is like just like that from uh, cross section. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it doesn't have any papers coming inwards or horizontally, right? Right, right, right. right. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, I can picture that. Right. How can others also send models to Robert? I actually I think just do it because mm. he's actually very approachable. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I notice that people often think that those big names are uh, very hard to approach. Like, <laughs> like they're too busy. They probably uh, won't pay any attention to people mm. like me. But actually, that's not the case. Mm. He likes to help people, mm. and and I, I'm sure if any new designer have any new ideas or any new design they want to show him, he, he would love to take a look. Mm. I'm pretty sure about that. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I actually just mailed to him. Mm. Yeah, again, I, I didn't have access to email, uh, no, so I just okay. paper mailed my, mail, mail, my mail. stuff to him. It wasn't that hard, but of course, later later on, we we all commute with, with email, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, many folders also practice other disciplines other than origami, so like um, painting, uh, martial arts, so, so on and so forth. So is it the same for you? Okay, so before I get into origami, I actually have a lot of hobbies mm. like like juggling and magic and oh. and mahjong and things like that. I, I play a lot of stuff, chess and uh, um, too too many to mention. But after I get into origami, I just designed to 
to throw those all, 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 all away and, and I just want to focus on this one thing. And pretty much the, the only thing I kept is besides origami is programming you know, for mm -hmm. obvious reason. And especially now I, I, I'm a professional programmer, of course I still keep that. But uh, other, other than those, I, I just want to fully devote myself to this. How about advice would you give to uh, young folders who aspire to be like yourself? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure if anybody wants to be like no, me. No, definitely. <laughs> you're, just, you're such a genius. Look at your oh, uh, am, am I? Uh, yeah, you are. Uh, Many people love you. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not too sure about it because I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of people uh, did a way better job than me in, in, in designing, especially. I, I just can't put much time in, in there. Mm. So, so I, I, I don't really have a lot of, lot of outcome. Uh, but suppose... Let's that, just say... If someone want to be an origami programmer like me, mm -hmm. what about that? Okay, so, um, well, you need to have a lot of passion. Let's that, 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 that just put it that way. Like uh, a few weeks ago, like like Jason mentioned, that some one of his students is trying to consider building an origami app, mm -hmm. and then he said that the student needs some feedbacks in order to decide whether he wants to do that. And upon hearing that, I was like. That, that, that doesn't sound right, because if you need somebody to tell you whether you should do it, then that means you don't really want that that much. And, and mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think organic software development is something that, that one can take it that, that easily. You, you have to be very devoted and very serious in order to actually get the, the job done, because it's a process that really needs a lot of effort. You have to ask yourself if this is what I really wanted to do, and if yes, then just, just go for it. Also, you need to consider a lot of different aspects uh, from both the software architecture and from the UI perspective, also the, the algorithm part, all, all, all things like that, and, and, and just put them all together in order to, to finish a, a good app. So, so it's, it's very hard. If, if somebody want, are interested in it, I, I would definitely love to give it whatever advice I can to them and mm -hmm. help, help them along the way. For some reason, very few people actually uh, reach me for, for, for any, any advice. And I, I hope that by releasing this interview, people would, would know that I'm waiting for them to come ask me, me stuff. Please, yeah. So, right. Yeah, I can see that through the, the, the you know, playing around with um, Box Fitting Studio is uh, so uh, intuitive, so simple to use. And I, I think you can see there's a lot of work that goes behind it. Yeah. So, on behalf, Thank you so much for the box building so good. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you were to start your origami journey in today's era with all the technology and the communications available, so how would you have engaged origami differently? I don't know, because I have the feeling that if I started it only by now, then maybe I won't even actually get into design, because I would be like, Wow, I already have so many designs on there that it can already take my whole lifetime just to follow each and every one of them. Why should I design it myself? And I would say, although that my design journey was a bit tough in the beginning, mm -hmm. maybe that's that's actually a good thing because I was in a situation where I have absolutely no resource and I am forced to design something on my own, and that's that's uh, what actually forces me into into this whole design theory and, and stuff. If, if I uh, were to start it right now, all the access to different materials and stuff, maybe I, I won't even be, be the same. Or oh, rather, how should we phrase it? Let's say you are mm -hmm. a young person now, you're going to start uh, origami. Uh, you're a young person today, then you're going to start origami. So how would you have like, um, engaged this discipline? Well, if I if I'm much younger and that's that's say much younger and have more time and mm -hmm. more energy, oh, I'll definitely work way harder than I am right now to to, to, to pursue the all all those different different designs I wanted to do. I uh, have have all those contacts with with the uh, younger generation designers and they, they are all very inspired me. I learn a lot from from them as well, mm -hmm. and I, I would definitely want to to put those influences into my own design. Mm. Things like that. I think I can do a lot better than I, than I am right now. You are well known for Seigai Ha and also the uh, No Cup King. Could you uh, talk a little bit about this? Oh, okay, so, so, so these two are, they, they have some 
some interesting similarities in in the idea that they both origin in. Uh, classical designs. Mm -hmm. the, the, this one is from the sim, uh, hidden symbol Zulu origata. Originally, it's a one sheet but was cutting. Those, those orizudas are connected from the wing to the, the head oh, of the next yeah, one, yeah, things yeah. like that. Yeah. And this is an uncut version, and therefore they have to uh, join by the, 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 base. the base. For the pinwheel, uh, now this one, of course, I believe we, we all did something like that mm -hmm. as we were kids, so we just cut the, the four corners and and then just curl the paper to, to the middle and then just pin it in, in the middle and then and it spins. The, the idea is uh, both the same. Now, is, is that, okay, so now we have all those techniques to fold complicated subjects from one sheet without cuts, mm -hmm. then maybe I just can design the same, exact same subject but without cutting at all. Mm -hmm. And for the, for the pinwheel, we, uh, let me the biggest, largest surface is allocated on four sides of the octagon. It's not on the corner because the, the corners is used to make the locking components in mm -hmm. the middle. There, there's a big unused area in the middle, so then I just think, okay, maybe I just use that middle part to build an axle right here. Mm -hmm. So now it, it actually has its own axle and actually spins, if you put it like that. Oh yeah, yeah. It actually, it actually spins. So why not try this? Thing? Right. Just put it right here. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> when I taught this in the in fourth origami marathon, I've seen quite a few people actually make a very, uh, very nice tool for it, and, and uh, I saw a few videos of this spinning very, very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The story behind designing this model is when. There, there's a guy who know that I'm, I'm an origami designer, and he asked me, "Okay, so can you do a pinwheel?" I was like, "What?" <laughs> and <laughs> then to me, that's not even origami; it's papercraft. And then, then uh, I, I was about to argue, but then I thought, "Hey, wait. Let's, if if it's not origami, then why don't just make it with origami?" So mm -hmm. then, then, I, then it just came out to me that I can actually make it happen using the theory of ERM. This is what what it ends up, and I I actually utilizes the the edges to actually make a pretty good color pattern to make mm -hmm. it looks quite nice in front of front. I'm pretty satisfied with nice. this. And when they asked me about uh, teaching the, the Oregon Marathon, I I sent them a few suggest proposed model first, but they they don't they don't actually like it. They they, they asked me, do do you have more? And I was like, um, okay, well, what about this one? Then, then they love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so uh, it, it's it's a it's a model that takes a lot of time to fold, uh, and uh, they very generously uh, allowed me a two-hour session, mm -hmm. and I was just be able to finish teaching this on time. I think all, all WM they are the usual blocks are two hours, right? Yes, 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 yes. yes. They and they, they just offer me a two-hour session to, to to teach this, and I have to kind of rush all the way to, to actually get this done. Yeah, so so it's a very challenging model. Luckily, uh, uh, quite a few people actually finish it on, on uh, during the teaching session. Yeah, nice. Mm -hmm. I love the, the interlocking part. It's so neat. Right. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that that's part of design. I wanted to make it no cutting, no glue. So I I have to also build in the components for locking it mm -hmm. by itself. Right. Yeah. So just curious, that you're talking about OWM. You also mentioned that you submitted some models, and then um, um the, the committee didn't really like it. So um, and then if you submitted this, and then they, they they liked it. So um, right. Could you share a little bit more about that? So in case like in future somebody wants to send a, a model to OWM, they also know what, what kind I, of requirements. I think things. I I think uh they they want models that would interest people. I, mm -hmm. I think that that's that's the biggest issue because it's it's one thing that. That you like this model yourself, <laughs> and the other thing is that people will actually like it. That, that that's mm -hmm. very different. So you have to s submit something that will make people or say, "Oh, I want to fold this," and then, mm -hmm. and by that, the people will, will actually buy the the the, the, the admission to the yes, yes. join join the event. That's so easy, okay. yeah, Be because they 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 still need to make money out of it. Event. So, so think about the marketing of the, of the model. Mm -hmm. like that. Right, that's a very good tip. Mm -hmm. yes. Right. So, uh, for also what you say, say guy, uh, I, I think they have the same motivation or rather the same inspiration. Right, you saw this model or uh, the, the yes, model um, being cut. Uh, the paper is being cut. And you say, oh, mm, maybe I should challenge myself to do 
or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and especially there was a, a period of time of, around uh, 2014 when I was quite obsessed with all, all the different crazy variations of the traditional mm-hmm. Orizudu. Uh, mostly because of the influence by, by a guy named Estalo on the internet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he had a website and he made all kind of crazy variations including uh, crown with multiple hairs and crown mm-hmm. with hands, legs. And of course, he also made a design very similar to this, the, the, the same kind of uh, Orizudu tessellation, mm-hmm. that type of stuff. But he didn't publish the details for how he actually did it. He, he had the CP on his website, but he has no photo sequence or, or, or mm-hmm. any hint for how, how he actually uh, get the structure collapsed. But, so I just have to try to uh, design my own photo sequence and I also come up with a very different crease pattern that is different from both S. Harlow's design and Robert Jada's design and resulting in my result that is packed more tightly than, mm. than both of them. So you, you can see that the, these Orizudo almost touching each other. Yeah. In the previous design patterns, they, they, they will have much more space in between mm. and the resulting less efficient design. Anyway, this, this, this is uh, like like I said, part part, part of my, my own journey for pursuing the all kinds of uh, Orizudo variation. I also have a few other design inspired by the Hiten Senpa Zulu Origata, including this yes, Imo Senyama. And uh, people have done also done this quite a few times before. But uh, there is, there is one special part about my version is that previously they will have the number of layers being imbalanced on the head part. So they will have like like three layers on one side and one only one layer on the other side. Mm. And as a result, the, the, the pressure will be very unbalanced for, and the, the head will just uh, tilt it to one side. But in my case, my design resulted in completely balanced layers. So the, the numbers of layers is exactly the same on both sides. So that makes the, the head and the tail pointed straightly. Mm. Yeah, and, and that, that, that's actually a very tricky uh, crease pattern and, and I hope uh, I can publish it someday. <laughs> and this, this is also uh, from the a, from a same book, it's called the Sugomori. And uh, it's basically uh, a crane on top of each other, smoking okay. on top of each other. And th- this is also my own version that I try to make the transition component so that this part is being cleared as much as possible. Mm. Yeah, things like that. And the most complicated one is, is this one. In my first attempt of folding that, uh, I, it took me uh, four days to actually just, just fold nine of them. Uh, of course, in theory, if you can repeat the same pattern indefinitely, you will even put a thousand one on the same sheet, <laughs> theoretically, but uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure nobody's going to do that in the foreseeable future. But, uh, that that would that would definitely be, be quite an achievement if somebody is crazy enough to do that. Yeah. So I noticed a lot of your models employ the, the ERM right. technique. So um, why so? And how did this idea came about? Why well, I prefer ERM so much? Be, uh, main, mainly because that the, I try to design something that that is different from what other people are doing. Like uh, we we already have so many models that are uh, based on you know, tree theories or or. Uh, other designing system, but not so much covering the subject of having uh, the, the flat surface. That, that's, that's why I, I try trying to utilize this as much as possible in, in my own design. Since I wrote an article about mm-hmm. the, the theory in, um, in my blog and then I started to see a lot of people also actually use it, which is a good thing. I can't quite remember what, how I came up with the idea. I think it just slowly come to me mm. by experience. Uh, I, I just started to notice the, the same pattern repeated over and over, uh, the, the same thing about how a river, oh, of course in the past people don't recognize that as a river, but then I noticed that the, the twisting of, of a certain pleats actually resembles the pleating in, in tree theory design, and I just realized that I can also call that a river the same way the river works in the tree theory as well. So mm-hmm. it's, it's what I pick up from observing a lot of different designs. It's, mm-hmm. it's not something that just suddenly clicked to me. It is, it's something I developed very slowly throughout the years. I, I have some other notes that I, I didn't bring with me, but I, I have like an Oregon diary, which I, I mm-hmm. just put down a lot of thoughts in, in words. And, and then 
I just like one day it just just all makes sense to me mm -hmm. after I, I observe the same thing going on over and over that how the pleats connects from one surface now I call it legs from one surface to another then it's just like that I realize that that's a very natural generalization of the tree theory because the if you consider uh, the tree just to be a one-dimensional structure in the ERM, then everything works exactly the same. The, there, there's no difference from, from the tree theory river and the edge, edge mm. river method river. So which of your original uh, design uh, models are you proudest of and why? I'll probably say this bath actually. Oh, okay. that's, that's actually one of my earliest designs. I, I, I think I designed it uh, back as early as, as 2012, I think. That's probably either either my second design or my third design. But I still love it even until today because the base is very, very simple. It's just a graphite bird base. Mm. And it has some very nice, nice touch on, on the head part, especially that like you can see that the, yes, the yes. beef nose and, and that that uh, granny smile, that kind of, kind of expression. I, I, I love the nose, it's like so real. Right, yeah. uh-huh. Th this is the kind of model I, I like the most, that uh, simple structure but very effective result. Mm -hmm. Now this is a lot of uh, talking about emphasis about efficiency, right? Like how do you achieve a certain effect with the minimum amount of poles or the minimum amount of um, mental yeah. and physical effort? Right, right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. right, right. Th mm -hmm. So, so th that's mostly the, the influence of Robert J. Lee because mm -hmm. he, he also uh, pursue efficiency a lot. When it comes to efficiency, there's one thing that is come to mind that is that so sometimes it's, it's good not to pursue in, in, in just one aspect of the design too much, especially efficiency, because if you go too obsessed with efficiencies, then you're going to sacrifice a lot of other stuff, so it's like the local thickness, that, that type of thing. That is also one conclusion of the ERM, is that there, in some cases, you can actually push the efficiency indefinitely. But mm. that that would result in uh, the local thickness reaches infinity as well. So, uh, the, so sometimes you just have to find a balance between efficiency and other elements, such as the ease of folding yeah. or, and whether it can be sequentialized. What I call a sequentialized <laughs> folding. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh huh. So nowadays, I would think that perhaps sequentializability is more important than, than efficiency mm -hmm. because that when a model is able to sequentialize you, you would naturally have very very good result because for, for those that are those models that cannot be sequ sequentialized you usually you just pre-crease the entire sheet and then collapse them in one mm -hmm. step but usually that will result in the paper being stressed out too much and you have wrinkles and other stuff all over the place or if not then often people would have to start by pre-creasing the, the full grid on the paper and not, not just the, the, the creases that need but every grid lines and that would also lead to the finished model having those uh, grid marks uh, yes. yeah, on, on it uh, that, that are still visible at, at the end and so those are all the, the downsides of having a model being not able to sequentialize if you have a good sequence then, then naturally uh, you can avoid the, the, all, all those not unnecessary creases and also it make, makes the whole folding process uh, more enjoyable. You don't have those complicated intermediate 3D steps. The finished space will tend to be neat, much neater than the collapsed ones. Mm -hmm. I think that sometimes in order to pursue the sequentializability, you have to sacrifice the efficiency a little bit because mm -hmm. fully optimized model tends to be impossible to sequentialize. It's it's hard to explain why, but usually that's that's mm -hmm. what what they, they got over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So while you are very well known for Sega Art and Pinwheel, you're best known for box paintings. So could you tell us a little bit about that and from the idea to the challenges and the completion? Oh, that's a long story that <laughs> yes. I can go on and on for hours. Uh, yeah. Right. A anyway, so I, I probably mentioned this, but uh, so after uh, I started writing to Robert J. Lamb for uh, like maybe a year or two, in the beginning, I didn't know about the second edition of his Organic Design Secret. I only read the first edition. Mm -hmm. And then I asked him a few questions. He was like, wait, did, did, did you read my second edition? I was like, no. And I didn't even know that the second edition exists. And so he said, okay, you should definitely check it out because you probably would find some some uh, ideas in, in there that will, uh, that 
you know, inspire your own design method. So I did. Uh, I purchased a second edition. I have a good look, and I quickly noticed that the the chapter about the Pythagorean stretch, and uh, I was thinking, oh, okay. I noticed that there there's something. Uh, some problem with the Pythagorean stretch that uh, they overcomes with what Robert did and called the, the Gasset slivers. Yeah. yeah, that thing is ma makes the the stretch very hard to to pre pre uh, precisely. So I was thinking, how can I avoid it? And there, there's one part when you mentioned about the the offset Pythagorean stretch, mm -hmm. where the elevation be from one corner to the other is offset by one unit. Mm -hmm. So one day I just start asking. Uh, Simply absurd question that what if I make an even larger offset? Like maybe what if I offset it by two or even three units? In the beginning, that doesn't make sense at all. But once you sink the the elevation back, let's let's say if the, the the offset is two, so you go from elevation zero to two, but you sink the elevation two back down to zero, then suddenly that opens a whole range of possibility for constructing new Pythagorean stretch components and. I noticed that greatly increased the likelihood of finding a good integral solution between all kinds of overlapping settings. So I come up with the idea of GOPS and I discussed that to, to Len and he, he loved that a lot. So we eventually decided to write a short paper on that mm -hmm. and publish on the 7 OSME. And after that I, I was thinking about, okay, so now we have the theory of constructing generalized Pythagorean stretch, but the problem is not everyone get the math. And maybe it's good to just have a tool to calculate in those Pythagorean stretch automatically. And as I working on that, I was like, hmm, just having a Pythagorean stretch calculator doesn't seem satisfying enough. I, it's better that it can do more, like that you just drag the flags around and then they automatically uh, calculate the rivers and the stretches or whatever needed so, so that, because one thing I experienced in the past in my own design is that I often need to have a lot of grid paper and draw those mm -hmm. possible layouts over and over until I find one that, that actually works. Mm -hmm. And that, that is very, very time consuming. I was thinking, if I can have a software that just let me just drag it around so I can quickly test all kind of possibility, mm -hmm. possible arrangement, that would be very, very helpful. So then I just decided, okay, Let's make it happen, and I spent like uh, a year and a half uh, developing the first version with all those stretch calculation, river calculation, uh, and things like that. Before I released the first version, uh, I, I made a few videos about it, uh, like uh, on the September, and the, the, uh, people start spreading the news <laughs> around. And it was a hype on the Discord uh, server. I, I wasn't in the, the, the Discord server mm -hmm. by that time. It's just, yes, so I, I know, know that a, a lot later. There was a quite quite a hype. Looking forward to, to that stuff. Maybe not everyone was getting what they are expecting in the, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. that, that Because uh, they they probably thinking that BB Studio is going to solve all their problems. But <laughs> yeah, it turns out that, that it, it didn't. All right, because it's... It's just a tool for assisting design, yes, yes. and uh, you, you still have to do much of the work yourself. Yes. So it, it didn't receive a lot of attention in, in the in the beginning, but I think as the years pass, people are starting getting more more and more used to the idea of how to uh, use that to assist the, the design. So uh, in in the past year or two, we, we started to see more and more. Uh, mm -hmm. Cool stuff yes, beyond yes. imagination coming up, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that that's the the kind of uh, result I want to see by by designing the software, uh, especially in in recent years. Uh, uh, Kimero, yeah, yeah, he's amazing. done he's done so many <laughs> designs. I I would I would probably call him the number one or BP Studio <laughs> master. Uh, yeah, so so if if you haven't checked mm -hmm. how his design, definitely go go see mm -hmm. it. He's, he's amazing. That that's the kind of way I want people to use EV Studio for. Yeah, nice, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so very very relatable. We were talking about yeah, the the artists still have to have a lot of their own uh, injects and their own uh, ideas, a lot of own work. So uh, recently I was doing the review. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I sent you right the, the image. So it's a lot of challenges, a lot of uh, failed uh, models. Um, to keep moving the, the, the images around but very thankfully you know with the, the software in place you know a lot of uh, uh, failed models a lot of um, 
errors are cast aside quickly, you know, then you can go on to the next solution, next solution. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, you're talking about the, the next version, right? So uh, yes. is, is, would you like to talk a little bit about that one? Yeah, sure. So in upcoming version, the, the biggest thing is that the, the optimizer feature. Right. So I have that that demo video on, on Instagram mm -hmm. not, not too long ago, but here's basically how it works. I have the, the demo version over here. So essentially, let's just say you, you come up just after you finish the tree. Mm. And in the beginning, uh, you, you will have a bunch of mass of, the, of flaps that are just, just cluttering all over the place. And so in the past, people will have to just manually drag it one by one until it's you have something you can start working with. Mm -hmm. Now with the optimizer feature, not only it will help you spread the flaps automatically, sometimes it will even help you to find a good layout. Uh, oh. Alright, so so uh, so with this this thing, you you can uh, have a few options of, uh, for example, uh, in of course in VB Studio you have the notion of with the heights of flaps you can keep that, or you can if you if you drop this, you then then all the flaps will begin with with the high beat zero, while keeping the radius that things like that, and then uh, you can either use the current layout, so you you would start, you, you will try to optimize based on the current layout as much as possible, or you can also try random layouts, which you would, you would uh, build a few random candidates and see which one works the best mm -hmm. and then start from there. And when, when you use the current layout as reference, you can also try a few variations to see uh, mm -hmm. if, uh, if jiggling the flaps around will slightly improve the, the situation. So first let's just try purely based on the the current layout because that's the fastest way to run. So I just click run. Now you would just quick quickly just arrange the flaps in in, in mm -hmm. the most efficient mm -hmm. way while wow. keeping everything okay, better. Okay. Yeah. And if I if I try a few variations, I can also it would uh, take a slight longer, but oh, okay. Uh, oh, this this result turned out to be almost exactly the same. Um, let me see if I can use some other example. Let's try a one that is not too complicated. Um, for example, okay. So, so like this, this is based on the the Guan Yu model by by, by Mao oh, yes. Okay, so 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 this one, and let's say, uh, assuming that we one day we got crazy, we want to do this design on diagonal sheet instead. Mm. Okay, so that's first change the, the type of grid to diagonal grid, okay. Now it doesn't make sense at all because uh, the, the size becomes like 95, it is, is a very big layer, but let's try to optimize it. So we just use these options, okay, so it's processing the problem. Now it finds that it can actually improve to all 86, now 82, it try to progressively improve the grid size, oh, now it's 73, oh. okay, so if it uh, progressively find better and better uh, mm -hmm. arrangement. Okay, now uh, let's see if we can go further. Hmm. And oh, seventy two. Now it becomes seventy two. Okay, so it's, it's getting better and better. What is this? Uh, fifteen slash fifty. Okay, so this this is like uh, you you would try the iteration for for at most fifty times. Mm -hmm. That's basically what it is. So so now it's at iteration twenty. But of course, if, if you think this this is probably the best possible, let's say seventy two is you you can probably get better than that. So that's that's just his skip, no problem. Okay. So we can just settle with seventy two. Okay. So you now try to fit uh, into the grid size seventy two. Now uh, the number down here now is eight over thirty seven. Thirty seven is the number of flaps. So uh -huh. we try to try to fit uh, the flaps one by one. Okay, now we'll just wait a little bit. Okay, it's almost ready. You'll get faster and faster. Mm. Okay, now. Oh! Yeah, that's that's the solution he finds. Uh, it's, now the grid size is like 80. It's, it's slightly bigger than 72 because it would, uh, it would, it, it could increase a little mm. uh, after the initial solution because the initial solution is assuming a continuous case. And so when it gets from the continuous case to the integral case, it, it might increase a bit, mm. but it's, it's still, uh, roughly speaking, the optimal solution 
uh, un under this this same setup. So th this uh, is basically what the optimizer is about. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. wow, super impressive. <laughs> yeah, I, I've I've seen uh, I've seen quite a few comments about how people anticipate the, the this feature and uh, uh, hope hope this will make BB Studio even helpful than before. Yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so lastly, uh, what kind of uh, origami uh, artist image you want uh, the origami community to see you as? Um, well, well if, if people can agree that I, I devote a lot of work trying to help others make better designs, then uh, that, that's what people, mm -hmm. I want people to think of me. To help others design better. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll try to pave the way for, for, uh, for others to to uh, achieve what they want to achieve. Nice, nice. Mm -hmm. That's super inspiring. Okay, and yeah. um, and then we conclude the interview. So thank you so much, Mutsun, for all your sharing. I'm sure your fans have a better understanding of you and your work and um, what a journey has been. This is the fifth interview. Thank you so much for all your encouragement. Uh, it really helps to keep the energy going, especially for us uh, content creators to uh, push beneficial content for you. So do like and subscribe, do follow Mutun on all his socials uh, in the description below and do visit Taiwan if you ever get a chance and we will see you in the next video. Bye! Bye. <laughs>